Welcome to the Three Tomatoes Virtual Renewal Summit. This is our fourth summit, but the first virtual one. The event is co-hosted by Ann Akers and Cheryl Benton. You'll be inspired, informed, and motivated by our fabulous lineup of speakers and panelists. Here's to thriving in midlife and beyond. The moderator of the Heart Health panel is Valerie Smaldone. She's interviewed hundreds of celebrities, including Paul McCartney and Elton John. A five-time Billboard Magazine Award winner, she's an actress, coach, and host of the radio show, Bagels and Broadway. The panelists are Bob Roth, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum, and Debbie Zip. Welcome to the Renewal Summit's Heart Health panel. Our panelists come from various walks of life and they're all connected by the heart. And when you think about how we have a relationship with the heart, it's very fascinating how many times we actually use the word heart in a specific term in our daily lives. I, just some examples. For example, I learned that song by heart or I'm heartbroken. Oh, she has such a big heart. Ah, oh, I had my heart set on that. Or my heart skipped a beat. And probably my personal favorite is young at heart. And today that's our goal to keep all of our hearts heart healthy and young at heart with this wonderful panel that we have here today to find ways to keep this amazing organ that connects our physical being with our emotions strong. So with that, I'm very honored to introduce our panel, cardiologist, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum, who very much takes to heart what her is her life's work. And when you visit the doctor's website, the phrase, live from the heart is prominent. Dr. Steinbaum has a private practice in New York at the uh, Juhi Ash Integrative Healthcare Center that encompasses heart health, wellness, and prevention. Previously, the doctor was director of women's cardiovascular prevention, health and wellness at Mount Sinai, and directors of women's heart health at Northwell Lenox Hill and has written a book. She's the author of Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum's heart book, Every Woman's Guide to Heart Healthy Life. So welcome, Dr. Steinbaum. Thank you. And let me move over to Bob Roth, CEO of the David Lynch Foundation, one of the most experienced and sought after meditation leaders in the country. Bob has taught TM, Transcendental Meditation, to thousands of people, is the author of Strength and Stillness, The Power of Transcendental Meditation. Bob has brought TM to millions of students around the world, to military veterans, their families, to those who suffer from PTSD, to companies and organizations. Bob Roth, a pleasure having you join us today. Thank you very much, Valerie. And Debbie Zip, who is the Los Angeles arm of the Three Tomatoes. When not working on and editing the Three Tomatoes, Debbie is an actor, producer, and writer. You may remember Debbie from the iconic, wonderful TV series, Murder, She Wrote, starring as Donna in the show. And she's been seen in hundreds of TV commercials. She's the author of The Aspiring Actor's Handbook, What Seasoned Actors Wish They Had Known. And Debbie is on the panel today because she's experienced a heart issue herself and has become a patient advocate for women and heart health because of it. Hello, Debbie. Hi. Hi. So great panel. Thank you again for joining us today. Dr. Steinbaum, let me begin with you. Now, 2020 is the year of female leaders in cardiology, and you have absolutely been at the forefront of this area of medicine. You're passionate about the many factors that affect heart health and integrative medicine. And I'm, I'm curious to know why this particular field captured your attention. It all started about 20 years ago, and I was in my training. And I saw this woman being wheeled into the emergency room. She was 53 years old. She was nauseous, sweating, throwing up, clearly uncomfortable, holding her chest, her stomach. And I was in the ER. I was a doctor in training. And I really respected these doctors that I was working with so much at the time. And they put this woman in the corner of the emergency room and gave her the diagnosis of gastroenteritis. And we proceeded to watch her have a heart attack in the emergency room. Under the care of these doctors that I loved and respected so much. You know, Oprah always talks about that aha moment. That was sort of my aha moment. Did everyone else notice what was going on? Women get heart disease. And up to that point, we didn't really think of women getting heart disease. 
And when I looked around to see if everyone else had the same feeling that I had, no one else seemed to notice or it didn't seem to strike them quite the same way. And I realized at that moment that I needed to do something about this. So I went to the chief of cardiology and I said, I want to do a woman in heart disease fellowship. And he looked at me and he said, there is no such thing. And then I said, well, I want to do a preventive cardiology fellowship. And he looked at me and he said, well, there's no such thing as that either. But he created a path for me by developing a prevention Cardi a preventive cardiology program. And that was about 18, 19 years ago that really started me on this trajectory of understanding not only women's hearts, but the connection between women's hearts, their, their minds, how they feel. And I was doing research on Dean Ornish's program on the East Coast, looking at group support and exercise and diet. And really understanding the holistic nature, especially of women, and that huge mind-body connection. And that was, that was the beginning of my career. You truly are a, a leader in the coronary world. As we said today, 2020 is the, the leader uh, of female leaders in this field. Uh, thank you for that story. And, and Debbie, I have to ask you, does that, does that resonate for you when you hear doctor's story about how there was really no program for women's heart health back then? Yes, very much so. I uh, had been seeing two male cardiologists for the last like 15 years and I had an issue um, with breathing or heavy exercise like walking up a hill and they just said it was something else and there was basically nothing I can do about it. But recently, a year ago, I really scared myself and my husband trying to just walk. And, um, but, but prior to that, I was smart and I changed to a female cardiologist because I felt that she would have a more, a better perspective for me as a woman. And especially since I have a really big family history of heart disease. And also I have uh, chronic inflammation with like psoriatic arthritis and other autoimmune diseases, which I knew could affect my heart. So that for me, but I have to say, I really appreciate her um, aha moment because we haven't done enough. We, we are getting there, but like with my disease, it, it's very, I didn't have ever had heard of, of it. What, and is your, it's, what is it? It's called um, coronary microvascular uh, disease, and it affects the small vessels off of the main artery. And I didn't know what it was when they told me that was the problem. So, and that's very underdiagnosed, relatively unknown, and it's predominantly a woman's heart disease. So I, I had no idea. Basically, I appreciate her being in the game. <laughs> we all do, absolutely. And Bob, when you hear these stories as a man, as a, as a teacher of a practice, um, do you find that there is a difference between how men and women approach their heart health uh, through the transcendental meditation that you provide them? Well, first of all, about two to one, uh, women learn to meditate, come to learn transcendental meditation than men. There is just an intuitive sense that of their bodies. There's an intuitive sense that just pills isn't enough. There's an intuitive sense that they're pushing it and that the trajectory that they're on is not sustainable. And so uh, two to one, if I, have a, if I have 100 people in a room, there'll be 30 men and 70 women. But I will say that once women learn to meditate, and Dr. Suzanne, who is a dear, dear friend, can attest to this, they'll be, and it's done, transcendental meditation is done for 20 minutes twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon. They'll be the first to give up that time because they're taking care of their children, they're taking care of their husband, they're taking care of their parents. So I don't have to, or uh, women TM teachers don't have to sort of convince them to learn, but there is that thing of no, 
self-care here, you are, you do need to take that time. Whereas men have more, more of a sense of entitlement. They just sort of will take the time at the end of the day to meditate. But uh, it has a huge effect. I mean, Suzanne, how is it? How has the meditation been for you? If I'm sorry, I asked. I Valerie. Yeah, okay. Go right ahead. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm sitting here laughing, Bob, because I I think you're you're so spot on. Somehow it sounds better coming out of your mouth than it does out of mine. Sometimes, um, I think women have a really hard time putting themselves as top of their to do list and that they tend not to make themselves a priority. You know, there's so many reasons. We, we look at the statistics and more women die of heart disease than all cancers combined. And they die of heart disease more than men. And, but these lines are, are starting to come together now. But for many years, decades, more women were dying of heart disease than men. And when we look at some of the reasons why, it was because women didn't show up. They didn't go to the emergency room. They thought, oh, I'll wait, I'll, I'll make dinner, I'll take care of the kids, I'll do everything else but take care of myself. Whereas men tend to um, just go. And I think that that's true. I am gonna answer your question, Bob, but I think it is true also with, with women when it comes to meditation or when it does come to reaching out for help a lot of times they're not sure if it's their heart. I don't know, Debbie, if you had this experience when it started for you or during this time, but it's not always chest pain. It's shortness of breath. You're not exactly sure what it is, so you don't know what to say. And I think that women are oftentimes, and I hear this regularly, I didn't want to be wrong. I didn't want to bother anyone. Men don't really care if they bother anyone. <laughs> they'll, they'll bother someone. Men are bothering people, so there's not a difference. But um, when it comes to this, this piece of self-care, this meditation piece, it's one of the most interesting things. And I often laugh at the story. Bob actually taught me how to meditate. And when I went to meet with him, I said, I really need to understand this for my patients. I don't need it. I'm fine. But I really need to understand this for my patients. So I'll learn it for my patients. And when I started doing it, I thought to myself, oh, like this actually works. It does something. And it became a very personal thing for me. Um, when I started meditating, I personally was going through a divorce. It was incredibly stressful. And I think back to really that time of learning it and how helpful it was for me personally. But I will tell you, that all of us women are really similar on a certain level. I, I find the commonality of womanhood so interesting, especially as I see women patients from all across the country. And the one thing that I will say is that when things get difficult or really busy or the world shuts down and we weren't quite expecting it, you know, those sort of things, that sometimes our self-care does not go on top of the priority list. And it does get hard to make this space for meditation. And I will tell you that I'm not always so compliant or good about it. I'm sorry, <laughs> um, but I notice in my body when I don't do it. And I will say, something's wrong, something's off with me, what's going on? And it'll occur to me what I let go. And I will make myself do it one day, two days, and by the third day when I start feeling back to normal, my, my new normal, um, then I don't stop. And I, I will tell all women, um, your heart and your mind and your emotions are so deeply, deeply connected that I will say that there are times where I think to myself, my heart is hurting me. And it's really because I'm missing that meditation piece. Um, so no, Bob, I'm not always great, but I, I, uh, I'm back to it. I'm back to it. Suzanne, you're great. You're great. <laughs> Let me get into uh, the actual physiology of what meditation does to the body, to the heart. Bob, you are an expert in this field. 
you must have tons of research you can refer to. But I also want to get a little bit to your background and how I think it's really interesting to find out how you got involved with this and why this became your life's work teaching people around the world. Well, you know, when, when I, I find it very interesting to talk to people who are successful in their field and say, oh, did you know you want to be a doctor your whole life? Or did you know you want to be a writer for television? And they, they say, oh, yes, I had a deep and So I never would have thought at the age of 18 if someone said, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a meditation teacher and run a foundation that's bringing this to millions of people. My interest was in politics. My interest was in I wanted to be the next Bobby Kennedy. I had worked for Bobby Kennedy in high school. I wanted to make a change in the world. I thought the change was through leg <clears throat> legislation. So that was my intention, but going to college in the late 60s, it became very clear that politics was never going to heal the soul of the nation. So I went over to education and I thought, well, I'll write educational curriculum. I'll get a doctorate in educational curriculum and I'll give kids tools that they can use going forward in their lives to help them navigate even then an incredibly stressful life. So I was going to school full-time, I was working full-time, there were anti-Vietnam War riots in the streets. I was just a guy who wanted to get an education and make a better world. So I was pretty stressed, Mallory, and um, someone told me about meditation and it wasn't a word in my vocabulary. I'm a doer, I didn't even know what it was, I'm a skeptical person by nature, I'm not into that stuff, but there was something very uh, there was something extraordinary about the person. There was a calmness about him, an equanimity about him, but he was sharp, he was clear, he wasn't into funny business. So I decided to learn it. I was told I could be skeptical and I could do it, so I'm skeptical and I learned it. And one of my first meditations, it was, and I'll let actually Dr. Suzanne, if that's okay with you, give some of the research findings because there's no one better in the world than her. And I've been on a lot of panels. Um, but the, my body took such a deep state of rest like this, just so relaxing. And I can't be hypnotized and I was not suggestive. It was a, like I accessed some mechanism in the body and the brain to take profound rest at will. And so one of my thoughts right after that meditation was, oh, so this is the tool I want to teach those kids because I was concerned about inner city school kids. So that was 50 years ago. And so now I run this foundation. We've now brought it to a million inner city school kids for free all over the world. And in the next five years, we want to increase that number to 10 million. So my background was in uh, wanting to make a better world, never imagining that teaching meditation was going to be that path. But now with trauma and stress, so all per that's a real pandemic right now, having a, a non-pharmacological, non-invasive um, medical intervention that can give your body profound rest at will turns out to be very instrumental in making a better world. I want to point out that your foundation has created um, a, an offshoot to help the heroes, the frontline workers, hospital nurses, doctors, who are, as we know, are under incredible stress. And that is a new part of the foundation that you're involved with. It's called, and Suzanne is on the uh, advisory board, um, it's called Heal the Healers Now, and it's a, a, a division of the David Lynch Foundation, and we are bringing the meditation for free to doctors, nurses, everyone on the front lines, orderlies, custodial staff. That's our goal in all these hospitals that are on the front, front lines fighting this horrible uh, uh, pandemic. And those frontline healthcare workers are suffering the same symptoms of PTSD that we find are active duty military over in harm's way. So we're starting off on a hospital level. We're doing some large research studies on it at Duke University and elsewhere, because we really think, again, we have to broaden our definition of what a medical intervention would be. Is it just a pill? Is it just surgery? No, it's actually these non-invasive integrative approaches. So we're just doing the research so that a person will be able to go to their doctor and, um, get a prescription to learn to meditate and have it covered by Medicare. Awesome. I, doctor, I want to get to you to talk about the, the research on, on how this actually works physiologically. But Debbie, um, I want to ask you a question. Do you meditate? No. <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. I, um, Debbie soon. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> yes, and, and I'm going to figure this out. Uh, uh, yeah, I, and I should, my girlfriends have said, you got to do this, you got to do this. Every time I try to just br breathe, I think of other things. And um, okay. I've, I've been under the last three months or really extraordinary stress but uh i do work in my garden i know that's gonna but when i'm out there uh, in nature and everything and digging and weeding and all that stuff i just zone out i'm in another world i don't think about anything bad and I'm not stressed at all. It's like nothing invades my mind when I'm working in the garden. But um, when it's a <laughs> 90 degrees out, I'm not out there. So yes, I need to look into this and I promise I will because I need some help. <laughs> Valerie, well, when you want to, you email me and there's absolutely fabulous TM teachers in um, Los Angeles and I'll have one teach you as a gift. So if you want to learn to meditate, you'll have your own mentor, your own teacher. Oh, my God. Thank you. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> awesome. That's wonderful. Uh, Debbie, l tell me a little bit about your, you know, how you went through this. We talked a little bit about the symptoms. What happened afterwards? What was the uh, medication or what did you do and what was the recovery like? Well, uh, I would say that I was put on, there is no surgery. There is, it's kind of inoperable. Um, I can't get a stent or, you know, the plaque and all of that doesn't apply to me. They still keep an eye on that with the arteries, but this is inflammation or damage of the small vessels of the heart. And basically I had asked for cardiac rehab and so my doctor prescribed cardiac rehab for my disease, coronary microvascular disease. Medicare wouldn't cover it. So what she did was she made a prescription that said I have angina, which is a symptom, not a disease in itself. And that's how I was able to get to do some cardiac rehab. And I got in really much better shape, but I still can't walk like I would normally walk more quickly. I can't walk up a hill yet on the treadmill and things like that. So I was working on that, but um, now I'm just walking around the block and things like that. But um, that was basically the recovery. And then getting used to taking about five medicines. Mm -hmm. um, that can target my my disease. Dr. Steinbaum, what do you have to say to Debbie? Uh, do you have any other remedies that might help her? Debbie, call me. I've been working on this for my entire career. I think before anyone really understood what microvascular disease was, at the time we called it endothelial dysfunction. Oh. And all of this time focusing on the lining of the artery. And I've put many, many, many women through a program um, that I'm going to say I created, but I didn't exactly create it. It's just based on the research, but it's an algorithm for women. And I think it might be able to help you. So Valerie, put us in touch. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> solving problems, solving problems. Doctor, let's talk about the research about transcendental meditation yeah. and how it can help heart health in general. So I want to go back to something that Debbie said, which is when she's in the garden, she doesn't think of anything else and it's peaceful. And I think that all of us need to have that sort of thing to do. Mine's exercise. I, I just love to exercise. But transcendental meditation, TM is a little different than just that. And I will tell you in 2008, when I met Bob, the reason was I was seeing all of these men come into my practice with chest pain and palpitations. Now, I didn't know what was going on, but they all worked on Wall Street. And I thought, ooh, something bad is about to happen with the stock market. Because <laughs> I could tell that something was going on because it was not one man or three, 
it was multiple, multiple men. And you remember what happened then. But what draw me to understand more about it was I can medicate people. And I was watching these guys develop high blood pressure, palpitations, chest pain. There were insomnia. I mean, it was a lot. So I could go through the list of every single one of their problems and give them a medication. But that wasn't the issue. It was the stress that they were dealing with. And I realized, well, there's not really an exact medication to manage that. And the other medications I was going to give, they were just Band-Aids. They weren't really going to fix the underlying problem. So that's what made me think, I've got to find something I can give them. And lo and behold, I start researching. And in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, which is like the Bible for cardiologists, I don't know how else to say it, um, there was a study on TM. And the one thing that was so compelling to me about this study, it was so carefully delineated what TM meant, what the practice was. There was not just a go close your eyes and breathe. It was a real study that was comparing groups. I mean, this was like a scientific trial. And I thought, well, that's bizarre because this is in the alternative world. How could this be? And the reality was in this one trial, there was a 60% reduction in heart disease based on blood pressure lowering compared to the control group which did not have meditation. I looked at all the medication research, aspirin, statins, they lower the risk of heart disease by 30%. How was it possible that this was more powerful for this group than an aspirin? And I thought, well, that's crazy. And I think since that time, Bob, you can quote me on, on how many studies have come out since then but hundreds of trials have been released on the effects of transcendental meditation on the heart. What it does is it actually dilates the arteries. And so we get back to these arteries and we get back to the lining of the arteries, which was my passion, endothelium. And what it does is cause these arteries to dilate those microvascular arteries too. And it decreases blood pressure and it decreases chest pain, and it actually decreases inflammation. So part of what drives the blood pressure from going up and the arteries from clamping is the fight or flight syndrome. This is what stress does, PTSD. And it actually decreases inflammation, which is part of this fight or flight. The epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol that drives all of this gets reduced. So TM is this morning and afternoon, mine's a little later than afternoon, but it's a twice a day dose, if you will. So it's a little different than that feeling of being in the garden. It's like a pill you take twice a day um, that actually has a long lasting effect to decrease blood pressure, decrease stress hormones, decrease inflammation, and one of the other things it does, if I could take away from the heart, is the effect it has on the brain. And there were studies that looked at EEGs, which monitors the brain waves. And it showed that when people meditated, the brain waves came, became confluent. They went in the same direction. So all hemispheres of the brain started working together instead of the maniacal way that our brain can think and all the different foci that can be lit up, all of a sudden, the brain started working together to calm down. Now, when I saw this research, I thought, well, geez, if we do that, because there is a direct connection between brain and heart, these speak to each other, that if we could calm this down, we are going to decrease all of those stress hormones that effectively direct the heart, decrease those inflammatory markers that directly affect the heart. And that's how we can decrease the incidence of heart disease. Again, dilating the arteries, but it's a protection. And I always think about 
the one organ we can't protect is our hearts. It's like it grabs everything from the world and we get affected by it. And so TM is that little bit of armor you can put around it. It's such compelling evidence that you've just presented to us on the panel today. And I know that Debbie is going to be getting the riches of both of you, which is, we did some problem solving, which is exciting. Valerie, you too, you can learn also. I'll yes, I, I can. And, and, and interestingly, I've been using the term heartbroken a lot lately. Mm -hmm. I think during this pandemic, we've all been affected by it on so many levels. And I, I've been using heartbroken a lot because my theater is gone and my restaurants are gone and New York is quiet and my heart feels broken. So I'm feeling very positive thanks to you today. And Bob, I'm gonna put you on the spot. I'm gonna ask you if you can provide a brief, quick way that we can start the process of TM. What's like the most easiest, basic thing we can do? Well, the technique itself, this is not a mass, but I'm gonna give you something, but this is not a mass meditation that you, like a Band-Aid, you, you have an app or someone just tells you like that. This is where you have a, uh, like a certified mentor or coach who just works with you privately, not in a big crowd. But there's a very simple breathing technique that we can do right now for two minutes that anyone can do. And um, what it does is it brings oxygen up into the brain helps to calm the amygdala, which calms, every, calms everybody, everything down. And so just for, t this is not TM, but it's something you can do anywhere. So I wanna, what I want you to do is just sitting comfortably and um, I want you to breathe in through your nose, nostrils, fill up your lungs and bring it up into your head, hold it for two seconds, and then out through your lips, your lips just, just gently, quietly, quietly, quietly. Empty out your lungs like a, basketball that's flattened and hold it for two seconds and then fill up your lungs again through your nostrils hold it for two seconds and then out and we're going to do that for one minute so i'll keep count i'll time it and you guys just do that you don't have to put your attention anywhere you can think about what you're going to have for dinner i don't care i just want you to do the breathing I hope everybody's following along that's watching today. I'll explain. What we're doing is we're doing a little, these three wonderful folks are doing a little breathing exercise and you're just breathing in through your, through your nostrils, filling up your lungs and then up into your head. Then you hold that for uh, two seconds, then out through your lips till it's empty. Hold it for two seconds and then back in. And what you're doing is you're just bringing oxygen up into your brain and helps to calm, feed, oxygen feeds the brain. When we're anxious, we breathe through our mouth <laughs> and no oxygen goes up into the brain. So we get more brent up. So this is just pausing. Okay, that's enough. <clears throat> Thank you. But you can do this at any time. You can do it if it's getting crazy around the dinner table. <clears throat> no one has to notice, you just, few breaths. I teach it to professional athletes. They're sitting, you know, they're getting, they're on the dugout and they're about to go up to bat at a key moment in a game. They do it. It's not transcendental meditation. That's much more profound, but this is also a lovely tool. Valerie wanted something that could be done easily right now. Valerie, yes. the most interesting thing, I don't know if you all realized what happened, but did you feel your heart rate slow down? Did you feel that sense of calmness? In a short moment, yes. Isn't that amazing? So what just happened to us physiologically, not just the oxygen delivery, but what happened was our heart rate slowed down, our arteries dilated, and the most, the first thing that happens when anyone has anxiety or panic is that you start breathing quickly, like Bob said. So if you slow down your breathing, but do it in that way to fill your lungs and, and hold it and then release it. It is one of the easiest ways to just bring down your heart rate, dilate your arteries, and it stops that panic. It stops that fight or flight right there. And you can actually feel yourself get calmer. Debbie, did that work for you? 
Yes, it really did. I, I remember it from my acting days when yeah. you would have yeah. to perform or you had to go in for, and you were a nervous wreck about an audition. Um, we learned it in acting class, actually. It's just what, you know, in life you tend to forget to do it. Uh, as a professional, you do, but that no, I remember that, and it's 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 very. I I'm I'm hearing it all. I'm hearing it all. <laughs> great, great. Thank you for that exercise, Bob. I'm wondering if you can just give a brief, also a brief understanding of what transcendental meditation is. How do you define that? Use the analogy of an because people say, well, what's how's that different from mindfulness, or how's that different from something else? So quickly, I use the an analogy of an ocean that has choppy waves on the surface but the ocean is over a mile deep, miles deep, and the depth of the ocean by its nature is pretty darn silent. So the mind is the same. Mind is that active, choppy, tsunami-esque. I call it the gotta, 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 gotta mind. I gotta do this, and I gotta do that. I gotta call him, and I gotta call her. I gotta make a list, find a list. That's all this. So it's a natural human desire. Oh, I'd like to have some inner calm, some inner equanimity, and the operative word there is inner. So meditation comes along, Valerie, to provide some equanimity. There are two basic types of meditation. The one that we're most familiar with is mindfulness, and that's more of a cognitive process that tries to stop thoughts or slow thoughts or have a different attitude towards thoughts. That's like addressing the waves. Transcendental meditation is a simple, natural, effortless technique. Your 10-year-old child could do it who has ADD. A simple, natural, effortless technique that allows your active thinking mind to access a level deep within where the mind is already quiet, key, already quiet and settled, we've just lost access. And as your active thinking mind settles down, then all the things that Dr. Steinbaum said happened. For this, you're given a mantra in TM, which is a word or a sound that has no meaning. You have a specially trained TM teacher. It's a couple syllables. Teacher gives you a mantra and then teaches you how to use it properly. Very simple to learn, very simple to learn. It's hard to do the mindfulness and control the mind and stop the waves, but it's very easy to access this silence that lies within. Thank you for that explanation. I think I know the answer to what I'm going to ask everybody from you, Bob, uh, but to Debbie and to Dr. Steinbaum, what can we do, a takeaway today, what can we do immediately to start get on the path to a healthier heart? What is it a supplement? Is it exercise? We know transcendental meditation. What are you considering? For me, my number one piece of advice in terms of what you can do now for women is to remember that this is the number one killer of women and to get a cardiologist. I prefer a female, but I think feel that women have to realize that you can have sim you, you, your heart is different than men's your symptoms are different from men many times you're undiagnosed or it, it's taken for granted that you don't have any heart disease so i think when you have a team of specialists for your health it should always include a cardiologist that's what i think women can think about today and do do today or tomorrow be, be part of a team be part of the be, team yeah make your heart part of your health team and make a cardiologist part of your team great advice doctor you know when we started this panel valerie you used words like heartbroken and you just said that again but that you've been using that word heart in so many different ways. And you mentioned that all over the work that I do, I talk about living from the heart. We are very much heart-centered beings. And I believe that if we actually listen to our hearts, we will do the right thing for ourselves. I think women need to learn to advocate for themselves. We know our bodies better than anybody else. And that when you're not feeling well, then you reach out for help. And if you don't get help from that first person that you talk to, then you go find somebody else. But we, we really feel deeply and we really do feel in our hearts 
my biggest concern for everyone during this time is that we don't listen and we try to manage things on our own. We need to stay connected to each other. We need to hug each other from a distance and reach out and really um, get a little grounded in what we feel and who we are. Um, our hearts are, are truly sensitive to everything. And self-care, which is about diet and exercise and stress management, that's part of, of this time and, and what we should have for the rest of our lives. What I'm hearing from all of you, honestly, is that tuning in to your body and to believing in your body. And Debbie, you said it very well, as you know, have a team. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't have a cardiologist. I don't even think about it. I don't have any heart issues in my family. It doesn't mean anything from what I'm learning today. It really doesn't. And so I, I, I feel like I have learned in this last 30, 40 minutes so much from all of you. Um, I'd love for you to give out your websites so people can access this information. Bob? Uh, HealTheHealersNow.org. HealTheHealersNow.org. Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum.com. Debbie? And I'm with the three tomatoes.com. <laughs> this I know very, very well. You certainly are with the three tomatoes. And that is what we're doing today for the Renewal Summit. I would like to thank my guests, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum, Bob Roth, and Debbie Zip. Here's to all your hearts and all our hearts. May they be well and thrive and strong and living from the heart. Thank you all so much today. Thank you. You did a great job interviewing us all. It was really great. Thank, <laughs> you. thank you. Thank you. I'm Valerie Smaldone for the Renewal Summit. Be well. <laughs>